You're listening to Travel Tales with Virgil. I'm delighted to say that today we've got Ireland and Lines rugby legend Paul Wallace. We have a great chat talking about what it's like touring as a professional rugby player with Ireland and the Lines. We talk about the Six Nations, the Mystique of Lines tours. We go in depth about that special Lines tour in 1997 to South Africa. He also talks about his favourite places to tour like Japan, Australia and New Zealand. Paul is considered one of the great rugby players in the professional era and I think you'll enjoy this chat. Paul, you're very welcome to the podcast. Um, the Six Nations are starting. How do you find watching the matches without the crowds? Um, yeah, you get used to it, don't you? Yeah. Um, you can create your own um, your own buzz. Uh, obviously, it's not as good as the real thing. But, um, you know, I think the supporters and players have adjusted uh, you know, those those first few months when there was no sport at all. Uh, well, this was the only plus thing I was getting to see myself play matches I'd never seen before. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'd actually played. That's how hard up uh, everyone was for sport I was looking back 20 years ago or so. Uh, yeah, so it's it's um, it's uh, it's great just to have it on as uh, something to look forward to at the weekends. I know. I can't wait. I have to say, you know, it really does give everybody a bit of something to look forward to. How, how do you think Ireland are going to do? Yeah, well, we're f- it, it's a tough, tough one. It's hard to make out exactly where Ireland are at the moment. Uh, you know, Andy Farrell is looking to move on. Um, yeah, some areas line out, etc. I think Paul O'Connell coming in there might might have a, a bit of bit of a help. Um, might leave Simon East to be concentrated a bit more on the breakdown defence. Uh, maybe a bit too much under his under his watch. So you know, just getting that extra extra um, voice in there and uh, you know an inspirational character as well but Andy Andy Farrell is you know someone I really respect uh, yes he's very inexperienced as a head coach at international level uh, but he's trying to to um, move on from the Joe Schmidt blueprint and I think Ireland have had needed to move on that become more creative and um, you know there, there's a lot of good quality players coming through, but to get them to top international level, that's a big jump from uh, club level. These guys that are performing so well for Leinster in particular, Munster and Ulster, Connacht as well, for that extent. Um, you know, it's it's uh, real competition for places popping up there as well, which is a good thing. But again, everyone's moving on. The French have probably made the biggest advances. Uh, you know, England are still there, you know, or South Africa or England, the best team in the world, or New Zealand. You know, you, you, for me, I, I thought England were the best team at the World Cup. They just had a tougher run in. Um, you know, South Africa had an easy run into the final. And I think that took it out of them, especially in the semi against uh, New Zealand. So, yeah, uh, it, it's going to be very competitive. The Scots are, are, are really up there again. So, you know, the uh, mentally, I think some of those games, like beating Wales on the road, uh, you know, the big, big, uh, big statements for them. Uh, so I think they're right back in there. So it's uh, the, the Welsh, of course, have fallen off a bit, um, and Italy are, are fraternally just struggling to to keep up. Um, but yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting. I think Wales will will have revamped a little bit. Uh, you know, I think they, they again adjusted to new coaching after the Gatland era. Yeah. Do you know what might be interesting actually is maybe being on the road won't matter as much because well, the lack of crowds, you know, might even things up maybe. Possibly. Yeah, well, I think there's some of the home comforts when you're used to your own hotel. Uh, one of the things we always found, especially if you went to France, was uh, the food. Uh, <laughs> you'd have dietitians and they'd come in and it would be, you know, it, it, when you go to France, you just tell them, look, just give them the food. Who cares if his calories are a, a bit over the top or whatever? Um, you know, just let them do. But when you, when you go down there and you tell them you want this and this, you get sort of this boiled chicken and uh, yeah. yeah I don't think it's very advisable to be telling French chefs what they should be doing albeit I think a lot of times they travel with their own chefs now don't they yeah I think they do I know it's a tricky question because no one knows but for this year being the line year what are the odds do you think it's it's a very hard one to answer I know for the lines tour happening in the summer 
Yeah, it's well, I think it'll be behind closed doors no matter what happens. I think it should be in South Africa. Uh, the preference will be to put it back another year uh, for me uh, to, to 2022. Um, and the, the big argument then is because it's less than a year to the World Cup then or a year to, out to the World Cup and there's all these other tour uh, scheduled Ireland of three tests in New Zealand uh, planned for 2022. But I think the World Cup, everything should be put back one year. Uh, not just the lines, the, and uh, that would make sense, you know, because it's it's okay. Australia, New Zealand haven't had uh, as bad issues with regards to to rugby and how it's and crowds, especially. Um, but I think World Rugby should just look at this and say, look, just take a year out, push it all back, and uh, the World Cup could certainly be pushed back another year. I'd have thought. I think the latest is that the Tokyo Olympics are going to be pushed back another year as well. So why we shouldn't the World Cup? Uh, and the Lions Tour and those big events, you know, it's, it's, it's a massive event, the Lions Tour, and I prefer to see a, a full-on tour a year later go go ahead. Um, and for that matter, you know, the World Cup, um, you know, it, it, there'll still be some lingering effects, you think, from, the, from what's happened during the COVID lockdown. Hopefully it'll be all gone, but uh, you still think some of the preparation, et cetera, could, could be difficult uh, because God knows what, what what's ahead, uh, what other curveballs we might be thrown with different strains, etc. And I think you know the crowds are a really important part now of of lines tours, aren't they? Do you know? And a professional yeah, game, it, it, it's a big thing. And uh, even for the TV revenue sponsors, they want to see big crowds at, at full stadiums. And uh, but also, I think just for the. Uh, it, it just adds adds to the event as opposed to the, the yeah. even just the playing side of it. Exactly. And I mean, what do you think they'll do? Do you, do you think they will go ahead with it this year or move it on to the, I think that's more sensible to wait another yeah. year. But. I, I think the, the big issue is uh, I don't think the World Cup will be pushed back. Uh, I think it should be. It should certainly be looked at, the logistics of it. Um, uh, if they don't, uh, I think they'll just go to go ahead this year, um, and I think it'll be could be a, a bit of a mistake. They they could be the, the, the revenue is, is really demanding in, in both South Africa and the home unions here, and it's all about the TV revenue. But I I, I think it's yeah, I can you can see why they want to do it short term, but I think um, you know like every business, well not every business, but so many businesses have been dramatically affected and closed down for for a year plus so um you know rugby's there they would still have the uh, you know the, the business will be there when they come back um but you know and banking has generally been uh, quite supportive of industries that have been directly affected so um i think there is the ability that they could just push it all back a year and tell us so you're you're very first i was looking at your profile and your very first Debut was in the World Cup in 1995 in South Africa. Is that right? That's right. Bloemfontein. Uh, yeah, it was uh, with a big win there. A uh, couple of pushover tries, which was it's great. Japan, but wasn't it? One of the easier scrummaging games, I guess, coming in against Japan. Um, so, yeah, it was. Uh, it didn't get on the scoreboard, but uh, with a few pushover tries, I, I, you can sort of, in the front row, you can take a couple of credits for that anyhow. But, yeah, it was a great experience. Um, you know, it was the amateur era. Last World Cup of the Amateur Era, um, and uh, you know, a great bunch of guys uh, got to the quarterfinals. Underperformed against France in, in the the quarters, uh, but we, we, had a, we had a great time. I really enjoyed it. We're based up in the High Veld, Johannesburg. Was uh, probably a bit safer back then than it is now. Um, um, and then up in Bloemfontein as well. You know, Travel down to Cape Town, um, and then we had the quarterfinal in Durban. Which was uh, which was lovely to get down to the sea. You know, for me, that the coast is, is where you want to be in South Africa, and especially Durban that time of year when you can still go to the beach. And uh, yeah, that, that was a very enjoyable part of the trip. And was that your first time in South Africa? No, I toured there in 1993 you? with the Irish Development Team. We went to Zimbabwe, uh, Namibia, and South Africa. So we played the Zimbabwe and uh, Namibia national sides, and then went down to George on, on the coast. And uh, then went inland as well and played up in, uh, oh, if I can remember, the Putchestrum or somewhere like that. Um, yeah, so we, we played against South African development team up there. So th that was uh, very enjoyable to be there in 93. Uh, you know, just um, 
uh, around the Mandela, you know, the turn, the end, yeah. the end of the apartheid era, uh, you know, South Africa, the infrastructure and everything was probably a lot more advanced, much safer country, mm -hmm. uh, and was rugby nuts as well at that stage for any 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 rugby coming into the country. Tell us, um, it, when you were there in 95, it must be very special then to go for a World Cup. It must be very different touring when it's a World Cup, is it? Uh, it, it is. Well, I guess I wasn't, uh, that was my first international yeah. tour. So everything was <laughs> quite different. Um, it, yeah, I guess it, it, it was because you're based, you're normally uh, traveling quite a bit in, in a World Cup, uh, um, so, uh, you know, when, when you're away from match to match, but we were sort of based in Johannesburg for, for most of that. Um, so yeah, and it was good to, to, to be settled there. And uh, yeah, it's a bit of Groundhog Day when you're stuck in the same hotel to the training ground and back again. But uh, no, we, we got out and enjoyed ourselves a bit as well. So, uh, and, and, and the locals, you know, I found people going about Irish hospitality, but uh, when you go to South Africa, I believe the South African hospitality is even greater again. Is it? Wow. It, and, and tell us, you on that tour, you were with your brother, Richard. That must have made it special, even more special. Yeah, you know, it was uh, Richard had been playing on, with Ireland since about 92, I think was his uh, first cap. And uh, you know, he was quite established on the Irish team at that stage. And uh, it was great to have a, that helping hand. And uh, he was there really from when I started coming into the squad. Um, and yeah, we, we really enjoyed that time together especially uh, because we wouldn't have lived together for quite a while at that stage because Richard had been up and left school. I was in university in Cork, so it was great to, to see a lot of each other. We, we, we latterly lived together in London in, uh, from 96 on, but uh, yeah, it was good to get to know each other again. On that did, tour. did Davis, did you ever play with Davis? Yeah, I played with David as well. So we we all actually toured South Africa, as it happens, in 1998 with the Irish team. But we didn't, uh, unfortunately, get to play on the in the same uh, team. We were, um, I was sort of rested for the first couple of weeks because I had just come through 97 Lions tour, hadn't had a break. So I was the only one of the four to go on that tour. Woody joined us, Keith Woods joined us a bit later. But um, they decided to, because of the, the season back then in in England was was so intense that you're playing every week. You know you're averaging fifty odd games a year, uh, as opposed to what twenty five yeah. maybe uh, is a, at a push for the pros this year. So had the first two weeks, but it was probably the biggest regret of my rugby career that we didn't all get to get on. You know, play one game together. Yeah, because Richard played with you on that first game, didn't he? In um, against Japan in the World Cup. That's yeah. right. Yeah, and and we played quite a bit after that as well. Yeah. Uh, and then David Latterly, um, uh, David was on that tour, but it wouldn't have been on the, the test side. Um, and then myself and Richard would have played quite a few test matches uh, early on. And then latterly in my career, after I came back from injury, I would have played a few times with David as well. And that one, the one you mentioned there in 1998, is that the famous one where there was a few battles? It was that that tour? That was... <laughs> there certainly was, certainly was. I saw some video footage of it not so long ago, and uh, I was staying well clear. I'd been down there the year before, <laughs> and, uh, uh, was in quite a few scrapes, uh, and you just found out. Uh, I, I knew the um, prop I was up against, Robbie Kempson, quite well. It all break up, and I just look at Robbie, and uh, we knew each other socially. We looked at each other and said, let them get on with it. But <laughs> with altitude, both, both those tests are at altitude. You leave everyone else tired themselves out and try and get suck a bit of oxygen into the lungs, you know. Yeah. <laughs> was, you, you, you know, it, it is quite physically demanding uh, aerobically, and uh, if you get a break to take uh, to take the air in, uh, myself and Robbie both uh, <laughs> wink at each other and said, "We're all right." And is it is it very different playing in South Africa then from a physicality point of view? Is it very intense? Yeah, there? it's well, there's a few things. Like, uh, as I mentioned, the altitude uh, takes a lot out of you. I think playing the front row uh, in any game, if you have a, a few scrums early on, that's going to do the same effect. So it probably doesn't affect uh, props as much, um, but it, uh, it, it certainly does. Most players find it. And also the flight of the ball, it travels so much further. So if you're giving away penalties inside your half, um, yeah, it's much bigger. But the other thing is the. The Afrikaners in particular in, in the South African side are so big, physical and powerful, you know, the pace as well. And on that hard ground, 
they they just travel that much quicker, that more powerful. And um, you know, on the on the wetter surfaces here, their physical ability is probably uh, not as pronounced. But if you're playing at altitude there, and you get these these giants who can really move coming at your pace, it's uh, yeah, it's very big physical game. And and they're hardy men as well, very hardy. And did you play in um, Australia or New Zealand? Did you ever tour there? Uh, toured New Zealand only once. Uh, you toured Australia as well. And uh, New Zealand, I only I was after I broke my leg, so I only played. Uh, came on in one of the tests. Um, I came off the bench, so I was uh, just trying to get myself back. When was back. that? When was that? Oh, it would have been around 2002, I think. Oh, yeah. It was, uh, yeah, it was a bit of a footnote in uh, <laughs> my history. I, I had a very bad, uh, broke my leg very badly in January in 2001. And yeah, it was never really quite the same after that. Uh, got a few caps off the bench, but um, and managed through the Celtic League with, with Leinster, which was probably the highlight of that. But uh, yeah, it was never quite the same player. We were quite, we were close a few times around that time, weren't we, in the, on those tours to New Zealand? Yeah, we're down in uh, Dunedin. We were so about two points in it. Uh, yeah. Could well have first test. We could have won that one. Uh, in Auckland, unfortunately, they, they cut loose a bit on that. Uh, that first test. test. That, that tend to be the, the way in New Zealand. You, you, you get one, you mm. can maybe catch them on the first one, and then there's... Uh, you know, there's a huge upheaval and they come out, uh, you know, you stir the hornet's nest and they get playing. And the, the other thing as well, when you're after a long, hard season and you play so many more games in Europe, you're nearly one foot on the beach uh, mentally. It's quite hard to stay focused because, you know, guys are going on holidays and everyone's doing this. So it's hard to keep that focus uh, when you come into the last game on a tour like that. Yeah. How does New Zealand compare to South Africa then touring, you know, as a visitor? Going to it, uh, yeah. It's I, I, my preference would be to so much more to South Africa. Um, I think it's the time of year you go as well. Uh, mm. It's winter. If you go in the summer to, to New Zealand, it's a completely different uh, animal. I was down for the World Cup there um, for about ten days and had a wonderful time. But when you're out in small towns like Timaru in the middle of winter or in for Cargill, it's it, it's not that great. A big fa- big fan of New Zealand. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, again, very hospitable people until it comes to the rugby side and the, the All Blacks, they tend to be a bit one dimensional in their view, more so than the South Africans, in my opinion. But uh, it's, again, a big rugby country um, uh, and a beautiful country, too. Mm, yeah. It's spectacular. Just something actually I noticed I must mention is um, your birthday. Is it, Are you the 30th of December? Is that your birthday? Yeah. yeah so that yes. must have been mad when you were young. Um did it affect? Did it affect your underage representation? Yeah, some sports. Some sports. I was a day. Yeah, I mm. was the youngest, and um, basically I was a day over age for for most teams. Uh, tennis, sailing, um, and Gaelic football as well. Rugby was one of the few because they back then would have gone from the middle of the summer ah, oh because yeah. it was a winter sport. So. Um, it's probably the reason why I, I was more uh, pronounced in rugby, you know, and uh, carried on in that, that career, you know, focused That's on interesting. It. I have a son, Paddy, who is, is uh, his birthday is in January. He was due on the 30th of December. And I remember the first time we went in and the kind of college has said he's due. And I was like, hopefully he'll stay till till uh, the 1st of January. And he had no idea what I was talking about. So he wasn't into sport. <laughs> Because it is an advantage, yeah. really, you know. When oh, you... Well, it is, yeah. I, I, I've um, read a few books on it as well. I, I did some research in ice hockey players in Canada and yeah. the, the proportion of players that were making it to top level because if you're bigger, you get into the first team uh, at that young, younger age uh, physically um, and, and you get the, the chances to get the reps or whatever and, and move up so that the guys that get into the NHL tend to be... Uh, much more skewed to the that time of the year, you know, the, the first quarter, first half of the year. So you're you're very well known, obviously, for that tour in 1997, the Lions tour, which was the first kind of one of the professional era. So it's the most probably the most famous line t- tour of all. Were you? Well, I'd, I'd say 1974 might have something. Well, that's to true. Yeah. About that. and, and <laughs> yeah. 71, 74, but yeah, I, I think it was the. Um, yeah, the Living With Lions uh, documentary, I think, really added 
to that. Okay. And also the fact that it was due to be the last Lions tour, you know, that was all the talk. We were massive underdogs going down there. And uh, yeah, we, we'd, um, I suppose we, we were quite professional in the way we went about things but uh, on the pitch, but there was a good amateur ethos off the pitch. And I think more so there was the characters that were in the squad, you know, everyone uh, would have worked, you know, uh, in, a, in a real job. And, you know, you, you think some of the guys now, it's very difficult to have a holistic view on life when you're just in this rugby bubble now from the age of 14, 15 and getting into various academies the whole way through and, and not knowing a bit of real life where you're out there where you have, you know, for, farmers from the borders or school teachers or lawyers and uh, a whole mix of people in there, yeah. And um, were you hopeful to get on that tour at the time? Or were you surprised? Yeah, I was very much so. Um, I was my first year professionally in, uh, moved to London, playing with Saracens in 96. And I was getting, I went to the initial um, meeting in uh, for a wider squad of about 50 players um, around Christmas time. Um, in the build up to that, all the reports that were coming into the club was that I was on to be picked in the squad. That was the feedback. Uh, then we lost to Scotland in Murrayfield. And uh, yeah, quite disappointingly, then um, Peter Clausey, who had been playing down in, in Australia, um, yeah, he, he got the vote. So I guess the Irish selector at the time was Don Lennon, gave him, was an ex teammate of his. So he gave him the. The, uh, he gave him the nudge. So I was uh, very, very disappointed in that and um, not to get picked in the squad initially. But in hindsight, uh, you know, I, I only missed a two days training in a one day training in London before. The, um, and, uh, you know, Peter, unfortunately for him, got, got injured. We actually passed each other um, in Heathrow Airport with the, the glass wall as <laughs> oh, uh, the. Really? Wow. Uh, yes, as, as I was coming in, he was going away. Um, yeah, so very unfortunate for him, but um, I, I, I had the confidence. I thought I was playing better than anyone else in that position. I was probably seen as a young kid, um, and it was Jason Leonard and Di Young, who had both played Test Series before, so they would have been very much the favourites to, to start. So I guess the fact of not being selected initially gave me a bit of... Um, a bit of hunger to prove prove myself as well, maybe give me a little edge on them in that respect. In that respect, and was it another level up comparable, say, to the tour in South Africa in, with Ireland in '95 with the World Cup? You know, from a professionalism point of view, was it several levels up? Was it that Lions tour? It was. I think playing down there, I hadn't played against uh, any of the Tri Nations away. Um, and yeah, w w would at that time South Africa were the world champions. Mm -hmm. so arguably, who were the better, New Zealand or South Africa? But to go there, I, I think the one thing when you go down there as a um, as the Lions, for them, it's like a World Cup final. It is the biggest game. They don't take you lightly. You know, there's games where say Ireland might go down, they're being taken lightly. Um, you know, South Africa, New Zealand, whoever it might be Australia, they're looking at the games, the Tri Nations ahead or something, and just, it seems a warm up game. Uh, but when you go down the lines, they're fully locked and loaded. This is the highlight of their four years. It's it's like a World Cup final for them yeah. and a uh, World Cup series. And that uh, just means what they come out with is, you know, that you get their best game. And if South Africa, you know, any New Zealander would certainly say that South Africa is the toughest place to go and play test rugby um, or any rugby in that matter. Uh, and I would say the same. Um, when it comes to the physicality, New Zealand might put more on the scoreboard, but the, uh, the sheer physicality of it, I think South Africa is certainly the, the toughest yeah, place to go. Definitely. The New Zealand captain. John Fitzpatrick. Is he, yeah. That was the highlight of his career was a three test tour to South Africa. The hardest thing they won there. You know, of his whole career, put that over the World Cup, winning the World Cup. Yeah, which is it, uh, yeah, it, it certainly is. Um, for you know, I, 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 and I would say, you know, it, it goes in different phases. There's different times when different uh, countries, you know, their form is is up there and might be a tougher place to go. But I think, uh, I think traditionally, yeah, you'd have to. And did it give that. you great love of the country? 
you know, because you really got to see as you were all over. Yeah, it very much so. Well, I had a lot of tours there and I've, um, you know, I've gone back and worked with Super Sport at the last World Cup, or sorry, at the, the uh, England World Cup. So I spent uh, 10 days down there around that um, and been known for friends' uh, weddings down there. And uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's uh, definitely a... Uh, and yeah. been, been down with Sky Sports covering the lines to it and there's also I've, I've, I've been back quite a bit since I finished playing and it's uh, yeah always enjoyed going back lots of friends there yeah. uh, Gianno Quinnigan who would have been uh, captain of the Irish team in 99 World Cup uh, lives down there so he'd be a good pal of mine and uh, a lot of South Africans as well who've uh, become good friends over the years did you make many friends from South Africans from that tour then? Would there be guys that you would know from the yeah, Lions tour? Yeah, probably not from the Lions tour because okay. we were uh, <laughs> we were very much divided on that one. But uh, yeah, Irish tour, certainly, you know, guys like Bobby Kempson and uh, Bobby Skinstad. People. But um, yeah, I think post rugby we probably got to know a lot of the guys uh, a bit better. It was John Smith and Butch James and guys like that. So, so some great guys, AJ Venter and... And do you know the way, like South Africa, like say you say in New Zealand, they say everybody is all they talk about is the rugby. Was it like that on that tour that the whole country was focused on the tour, or is it a bit more relaxed? Or? Yeah, well, we were in a bit of a bubble, but yeah, there were certainly um, it was the main focus uh, nationally. The, the 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 press was very focused, very um, very pro South Africa. Let's say not too biased. Yeah. Uh, which was also quite good for us to uh, get an extra chip on the shoulder as if we needed another one um, going into the test series. Being, you know, so even though we're playing some great rugby, being written off that we wouldn't have a hope once it came to the box. And, yeah. uh, you know, they, they were obviously at such a high after winning the World Cup. You know, the, the attitude was that they'd have won every other World Cup as well if they'd been allowed to play in it because that was the 95 the first that they were allowed to play in. That's true. And uh, like you played with amazing players on that tour, like Martin Johnson, he called you his player of the tournament, which was I thought, a great major compliment. It was lovely. Yeah, I think that's probably because Jano was behind me in the scrum, so he's probably <laughs> given a, a backhanded compliment to, my, to himself. Uh, I, well, I think the great thing about the Dan and the, the team and the, the performance was uh, there was 15, you'd nearly say 15 <laughs> players of the tournament in the squad, but even further than that, it was the whole 36 uh, and it was a competition for places really drove everyone on and there was guys that didn't make the test side who probably might have outperformed their opposite numbers, you know, you think of someone like Alan Bateman was outstanding during the tour and didn't really get a run, there was, there was you know, uh, guys like Eric Miller had played really well and got injured yeah. with, I'll tell you, well, he, he got a flu and it's unfortunately, I think he'd taken a cough mixture, which was had a banned uh, substance, and so he had to cry out from the first test. You know, he was, uh, it was meant to, there's only four Irish and all four of us were due to, to play that first test. We yeah. were all selected initially, and then Tim Rodberg came in and he played exceptionally well. Probably doesn't get the credit he deserves, uh, especially his pass for the Neil Jenkins try in the first test. You know, yeah. it was overshadowed by, I guess, Matt Dawson, yeah. but um, uh, that, that was superb, probably, you know, the best try we scored in the series. And um, what was like Ian McGeekin like? Is it like you know, with living with lines himself and Jim Teffler were, they were, they came across as inspirational people. Yeah, you know, Jim Telfer, the uh, people go rave about his speeches, and and rightly so. You know, he'd really have the hair standing on the back of your neck, and he'd always get that extra couple of percent out of you at a training session. You know, you'd be doing kickoffs, and you would think you're going flat out, and when you get <laughs> A bit of a tongue, tongue lashing from Jim. It also you, you'd find that extra little two or three percent, and those bits here and there. That the mental toughness he instilled, I think, was huge. Um, but equally, Ian McGeekin was a uh, fantastic as motivator. Um, tactically, he was superb, and we played this great offloading game. Um, probably saw more of it in the uh, pre-test series, which became uh, a bit attritional. Uh, till the third test where we probably played our best rugby, but um, things, you know, a couple of things, if they went, uh, a couple of passes went to hand, we could have played uh, some scored, some amazing tries. But um, yeah, he, he introduced all that. And uh, Frank Cotton, the manager, was exceptional as well. You know, he brought in that um, 
the real lines ethos about the players enjoying themselves, training hard, uh, everyone pulling together. And most importantly from other Lions tours was that there was real competition for places. And I think, you know, you'd probably say there was seven, eight positions there that people wouldn't have called as starters for the test side uh, when it was selected. And that was all down to giving everyone a free, a, a fair go at it, which makes a real happy camp. And, you know, I suppose it's really important, as you say, the, the ethos, but the, being able to mix people from four countries. So the social aspect of it is really important, isn't it? On a, on a Lions it, tour. It is, uh, and uh, yeah, I think Ireland has probably lost out on that at World Cups. It, it's one thing when you're away for uh, maybe three weeks in a country at the end of the season, it's in, bang, you're gone by the time you arrive. Uh, but when you're away for six, seven weeks, if you're not enjoying yourself, and you can see some players who are, um, you know, lock themselves away in their hotel room. It's all about training, eating. They, were, they they would go start going off form, and the guys that were enjoying themselves, you know, it just it, it would just feed into how they were playing, how they were training, and um, uh, yeah, if it's, and if you're enjoying a, tri- a tour like that, I do think you play better over over the distance. And uh, the Lions obviously has a a special sort of folklore around that yeah. and uh it's it's sort of added and you know i think with ian mcgeekin and i think with warren gatlin since he's been there he's 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 taken that in as well and uh, there have been a few tours in between that that they were a bit locked down but they all ended up um not going particularly well players not enjoying themselves but, uh, bonding wasn't there you know 97 was probably a lot about the bonding uh mental toughness and you know, some of the scrapes we had to find out of our, for ourselves, but also enjoying each other's company is huge. And uh, I think the fact that Jim, Fran and Geach had, you know, all been lines themselves, they'd been, uh, you know, hear some crazy stories about the 70s and what had gone on before that. But they, they all knew when you're away the other end of the world, it's all about, uh, you know, forming as a team. It's, uh, you need to do it quickly. And, uh, you know, so the social side is important. And was it great crack? I mean, was it, were there great characters on it? I mean, through the video, it looked like it anyway. There, there certainly was. Um, and uh, I, I'd imagine if uh, all the original footage was put in, it would be <laughs> looked like a bit more riotous. Um, yeah, there was. You know, <clears throat> John Bentley obviously crops up quite a lot and he was a, a real character. Um, but also, you know, his professionalism from the rugby league side was great. But he, he was always up there, uh, you know, entertaining. But uh, the likes of Doddy Weir, uh, Rob Wainwright, you know, fantastic. Um, you know, the, the whole way throughout the, the boat squads, everyone mixed uh, so easily and so openly. Um, you know, it was great, great. And, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm still great friends with, with a lot of those players to this day. Wow. And what's your fondest memory of the tour? It can be anything, playing or place you visited or is there something that jumps out? Well, I think it was probably winning, well, running out onto the pitch for the first test. Um, you know, it's amazing how everyone's talking about the 30,000 supporters that should be going down. Uh, before the first test, it was, we hardly saw a supporter down in South Africa. And then for that first test, it was a, a big bank of supporters over, and we, which we weren't expecting. Uh, big, but it, it wasn't a full sea of red that they saw in 2001 in Australia after that, but... Uh, you saw this and it was, you know, just get that support. And then obviously to go on and win those, uh, those two tests of celebrations afterwards uh, and then getting right back into it again, you know, that, that whole week had turned around that I got selected uh, where I wouldn't have been expected to went training and had Jeremy Davidson, who was on the same team as me, stamp on my knee. Uh, and I thought I was out. I wasn't able to train for the next couple of days. Um, literally, they only made a call on Friday um, and I managed to get through it. So it, to, to, to go from being picked to thinking you're out to getting to play the game and then to win. Uh, yeah, uh, especially how it started the first two scrums. We, uh, well, probably arrogance from my side, uh, trying to scrummage too high and powerfully because I, uh, under the image of having Johnson and the big English back five behind us, that, that we'd be able to power scrummage them and ended up on the receiving end for the first two. But then how 
we were three 0 down and managed to to readjust and then dominate the scrum for the rest of that game in the series. You know, this, but that 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 was probably the, the big thing. Getting a stare after I've messed up in two scrums and uh, Johnson just gives one of those. He doesn't even have to say a word. You know, uh, the fact that we managed to to get back on the horse, fix it, and go on and win that test match was yeah. And how, did, how did that work? So he gives you a stare. Did you then have a little chat going, right, we need to go lower or whatever? Or did you? Uh, no, there was no words even spoken. Uh, I guess on, on our put in, the tight head is the, the, the fulcrum of the whole scrum, the, the, the keystone. And uh, because of the power we had, I've gone up against Oz Durant, who was probably six stone heavier, big, powerful man, but he's very tall. And of course, they have a big back five as well. So the power even greater than the power we had. So uh, it was just a bit of over, uh, over <laughs> overly optimistic or overly <laughs> confident going in to try and power scrummage because we've been doing that uh, during the, the, the matches I played in uh, during that tour and we'd been very successful in the scrum, but it was a big difference then against the box and especially Alz Durant, who I was up against. Uh, but once we readjusted and just, you know, front rows about, it, it, it's a form of wrestling. You put the other person into as uncomfortable a position, pushing position as you can, and then you start working them. Uh, so once we started doing that, and we went back to what uh, we're very good at in Europe, especially in Ireland at the time, was uh, technically scrummaging, putting your opposite number in a, a, a tough position. And they found that very difficult to deal with. Am I right in thinking that you played all three matches? That's right. Yeah, yeah, Andre. The, the whole, um, yeah, the, the whole eighty minutes back then. Um, yeah, you didn't have the, the full front row. Like no one does that there. now. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's um, yeah. Very few. Uh, if you see a front row doing 60, 70 minutes, they're normally getting plaudits. Uh, but that would have been very typical back then. You know, I even remember playing. Uh, full test matches against France and flying back and playing a half for my club the next day. You know, that's sort of, uh, yeah, which, which is, I think, I think for uh, player welfare, you shouldn't be playing back-to-back matches, but um, I would like to see the, um, it, it's very difficult to do because there's ways of cheating the system if a guy is injured. But um, I think the fact if you're playing 80, 80 minutes, um, it gives you a chance to wear down your opposite number. So it's a battle over 80 minutes between you and them. As opposed to, um, you know, I remember playing against Australia and we uh, down in '99 and, and uh, beaten uh, by a big score in Brisbane, but uh, we completely dominated their scrum. And uh, the the next scrum, there was a guy called Glenn Panaho who came on and a good scrummager, and we had a really tough go at it. But he he was off the pitch at 25 minutes, and I went in after it, presuming he was injured, uh, but he wasn't. He said, "No, you, we're going to go take your legs out of you." And then we'll bring on the, the other guy who's more of a ball player. And this is before, uh, you know, mm-hmm. you had uh, the players coming on. So I, 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 what it has done is you just brought in these massive bohemians now, uh, as opposed to uh, technically, you know, tactically, that's sort of endurance where you can just go and it's a, a one against one and you have a, a big battle, you know, through the years. It's great to have those with, you know, the Jason Leonard's, the Califanos and the Alistair Ransom, people like that, where you played out. We just it's over 80 minutes so it's not just two scrums at the end of the game you know you come on for 20 minutes and you might have one scrum two scrums and, um, yeah exactly. have you actually been on any other lines tours you know as a pundit or as a punter yeah i was in uh, australia um and south africa so i was lucky to go down with sky sports in the studio which was uh, which was great and um, a couple of old, old mates as well, Yain and uh, Will Green down in South Africa. And then I was lucky to be in the studio with Geach in Australia when we won that series, which was, uh, yeah, both fantastic, uh, fantastic trips. Unfortunately, I, I, I was offered to go to New Zealand uh, on the following one, but uh, it was a bit close. My twins were born on... Uh, and what date is that on the uh, in August, start of August? So yeah. uh, I, I wasn't going to get the, the leeway to go down to New Zealand for that uh, that one, which would have been fun. And what's it like going, you know, being there? Uh, you know, is it a very different view of it? Like, do you, did you can you get that atmosphere of a Lions tour even as a pundit? Yeah. Definitely, 
definitely. Um, so much more so. And, and the amount of friends that you find throughout the world, you know, uh, do quite a bit after dinner uh, speaking and, you know, the States are in, in um, Asia. And uh, all of a sudden you get all these people, all these characters, you know, from the Middle East, fr- from rugby coming together um, yeah. down for those Lions tours and for World Cups for that matter. Uh, all in there so it's uh, the social side of it is extraordinary to, to catch up with so many so many pals from around the world that, that travel to these um, yeah. yeah and also catching up with former teammates that, that also travel down there some guys they might have seen for a while um, so that's that's, that's uh, and did you go to the did you go to Japan for the World Cup or have you been to any of the no I didn't no. get to Japan I had I had been over there a couple of times before once I uh, went over with my school after I finished playing as a as an ambassador stroke coach um, where they played in a tournament and uh, to Fuku, 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 uh down the south and uh, went over on a just to speak at an event uh, in Tokyo then. Uh, a few years after that, which was a yeah, great experience. Uh, very enjoyable to go over there, probably more so than during the World Cup because you were really thrown in the deep end where, uh, you know, the World Cup, you'd have been in a, a, a group. So I had one or two locals that had that showing around and, uh, yeah, v- v- very enjoyable. What a great, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful country, isn't it? Spectacular, very yeah. different. Than, uh... Yeah, I think anywhere I've traveled in the world is the most uh, culturally different to the western world and uh, they have their own way of doing things and uh, a lot of ways better <laughs> so so rugby has been great for you from the point of view of touring so you you know you've been all over so australia as well did you say that you played in australia yeah we had a, yeah, we had a tour there in 99 before the world cup yeah so we uh, got around to brisbane sydney perth so yeah, enjoyable tour. Enjoyable tour. We didn't win either of the test matches. Went very close in the second test uh, in Perth. Um, yeah, it was uh, we were winning until I think quite well into the second half, but unfortunately didn't get across the line that time. And was that Brian O'Driscoll's debut? Is that right? Yeah, Brian. Uh, I think it was the first game. Was in yeah the first test in Brisbane. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, that was the first tour he's on. That's right. And we had a really great scrum half, Kieran Scally was coming through who was a schoolmate of his and yeah. in fact most of the talk was about Kieran Scally at that stage yeah. but Kieran blew his knee out then in the uh, warm up I think to the World Cup and uh, yeah that was the end of his career um, so maybe himself and Brian we could have two and what age was Brian then was, was he superstars coming out of that same class in school. yeah he probably because I think Brian O'Driscoll was a scrum half in, in school so he probably kept him off the <laughs> off the spot yeah, that's the thing about rugby, though, isn't it? An, an injury can happen any time and, you know, career can be changed, you know? That's it. You know, you look at things and I suppose myself, I was 29, I think I just turned 29 when I sort of broke my leg, which would have been probably lost out about six years of paying the best rugby I'd, I'd ever played. Uh, was just felt I was getting, you know, getting yeah. better and better. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's sort of... I only paid well professionally for seven years, and that was about four years in when I did that, or five years in. So yeah, I left a lot behind and had to retire quite young. But when you look at guys like Kieran um, and many other players, you just think I was very lucky to 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 have had what I had and uh, managed to achieve what I achieved. And were you very frustrated at that time, or did you just have to deal with it, or how? Oh, yeah, very much so. Very much so. Yeah, we we just come off a stage where all the non-Irish based players had been left out of the Irish team as well. So I was trying to fight back into the Irish team. But uh, and there was a Lions tour coming up in 2001. But uh, yeah, my form was at such a level. I was I'd have been very confident in achieving both. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's life, isn't it? What, what could have been? I know. And at the time, you were playing for Saracens in London. Was that a great experience? Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, we played with some truly brilliant players. A great club, and yeah. they've got a lot of bad press of late. Um, but you know, they, they they still have the character between the you know it was always the poor man's club in in London, and indeed the first division. You know, they were generally up and down from the. The Premiership back then, uh, till the start of the professional era, and Nigel Ray, you know, it was so supportive. There was a lot of um, 
a lot of owners that came in and when they saw there could be no money made out of the, the rugby, just quickly ditched them. But Nigel was never there about the money himself and Nicolas as well. They were just there about creating this sustainable club. Um, yeah, unfortunately, you got a lot of flack, which I think people um, very easy to throw, throw mud. And yeah, OK, they, they might have done the wrong thing with paying players, but uh, everyone else was supposedly was doing it, but maybe not to the same extent. Uh, in, in how they got on with it. Um, yeah, uh, but the, the, the players, you know, the, the likes of Felice Sella, Michael Lina, you know, Richard Hale, Franco Pinar, Kieran Brackett, you know, it was just internationals throughout. Um, and, and I think those two players in particular, Michael Lina and Felice Sella, when, when I first went over, they, they arrived at the same time. Uh, you know, Philippe is the most capped player in the world, Michael, top point scorer in the world. Uh, to have those guys in there and what they put in, especially Philippe at 36 years of age, uh, physically, he was just immense. I, I'd i still call him probably the, the greatest player I ever played with because of uh, uh, what he could do at 36. I don't think I've ever seen any player close to it. You know, he, was, he could still have been playing for France at that age. He was just electric and what a fantastic player. Uh, the but you know throughout the you know great friends um, and we were, you know, we had a lot of players New Zealand Samoa uh, Argentina um, so it was a great mix to to get to play with all these players you know obviously Welsh Scots English yeah it was a great cosmopolitan and, bunch and and the cosmopolitan city what was it like living in London then while you were playing uh, there. Well, we were living quite a bit out. We were the second last stop of the uh, <laughs> we're up by Cockfosters, uh, the, the end of the Piccadilly line um, from Heathrow. So it was a bit of a trek away from the glamour of the city centre. Um, but it was probably, from a professional point of view, it was quite good in that you were uh, so focused. Uh, and I know a lot of wasps would have been uh, big competitors of ours. <laughs> London Irish guys and the Harlequins, they were in much more, uh, I suppose, uh, social environments. And uh, yeah, we, we were a bit jealous of them that we didn't have what they had going on. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was uh, enjoyable uh, all the same. We, we made the most of it. Where's your favourite stadium to play in, in the world? Um, I, I think it's Kings Park in... Uh, Durban and South Africa, uh, it's just it, 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 it's just so vertical. The yeah. crowd is right on top of you. So seventy plus thousand. Um, it's all, always sunny there, or well, always warm. You can get some tropical rain. Uh, but the big thing is the big prize, the barbecues they have outside, so everyone parks up, and the party carnival. Uh, uh, atmosphere around the ground. It's um, you know <laughs> you go to Twickenham and the the, the the picnics in the car park, but when it's uh, twenty five degrees and everyone's in shorts Definitely. and t shirts with the bry on, uh, it, it it's much more enticing. A different level. And what about yeah. other sports? Are you a fan of other sports? Have you travelled to well, any I do other a lot sports? Of sailing. Oh, uh, yeah. A lot of sailing, so that that's probably my big one. Uh, go do travel to do some events uh, and. But generally, just doing most of it locally here in Dublin, uh, Dublin Bay, and uh, down in West Cork if I get a chance. And uh, yeah, that, that's probably the, the main hobby now. So, um, my last question that I ask everybody is if you take four deep breaths, close your eyes, and think of your happy place, where would that be and why? Yeah, um, Bali, possibly a place called Uluwatu. Uh, a little beach there where you can just get a plastic table, fresh fish, bintang beer, and your feet are in the water, lapping, lapping up while you have your dinner. That that uh, yeah, I, I, Bali. We I've been there well, three three different times, uh, and uh, albeit it's got a bit built up. Uh, there's still some nice parts, Uluwatu, uh, one, one area in particular, uh, that's still, um, you know, still got that bit of Bali magic on it. Uh, yeah. And maybe the other one is uh, down to Zambezi as well, a, a former Saracen teammate of mine, Gavin Johnson, who played for the Springboks. Uh, 
Gavin has got a, a place down there really in the most remote location I've ever been to in Africa and he's got a lodge there and that 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 I guess the tranquility of both of those places a, a long way away at the moment yeah and that a lodge like on the river is it yeah just across from Chobe National Park so we, we actually had a I wonder it was uh, after the 98 tour uh my, when my brothers were there in South Africa as well, we flew up after the, the second test and with Malcolm O'Kelly and uh, another Saracens teammate, Andy Lee, and we went to Dinfic Falls, white water rafting. Then Gav came, collected us, sat on the back of a big bucky with the seats there, a couple of coolers of beers, and just drove down to Chobe National Park with elephants crossing in front of us, giraffes. It was just magical. Uh, the whole way down to close to the Namibian border and then back into Zimbabwe. It was an uh, amazing amount of wildlife we saw that day. It was unbelievable, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Paul. Thank you. Great. My uh, pleasure. Travel to some of those places soon. I know. See, that's why I love doing this, because I just hearing that about, about the Zimbabwe and all that. I find that it's nice being able to talk about travel rather than going, oh, we can't travel, you know? Gives us hope, doesn't it? I would ask if you could please subscribe to Apple Podcast. So a new episode will appear in your library every week. I would also really appreciate if you could leave a rating and a review as it helps others to discover this podcast. To find out who's on every Tuesday, please follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Travel Tales with Fergal. Stay safe and keep dreaming of future travels. Travel Tales with Fergal.